and welcome to BIA's Leading Local cool. Insights yeah. Podcast, where we examine the trends, technologies, platforms, and industry activities related to local media revenue. I'm Rick Ducey, BIA's Managing Director, and I'm here today with Steve Newberry, who is CEO of Q. Um, before we get started, Steve, let me just share a bit about your background. You you have a terrific, you're, you're, you're a radio guy. Let's start there. <laughs> um, you're an accomplished broadcast executive, uh, particularly in radio, uh, with, dare I say, over 40 years of experience um, in the radio industry. Uh, and just personally, having worked with you through several different roles, um, you know, uh, you're a person of integrity. You like to collaborate. Uh, and you've been a strong advocate of the radio industry in, in various roles um, and been recognized as such. At Q, uh, Steve oversees this innovative technology, which enables radio stations, local radio stations and network radio to provide an enhanced listener experience uh, and advertising experience to help monetize visual advertising and radio, something that seems maybe as a oxymoron, but we'll find out that's certainly not the case, using in-dash displays of vehicles, uh, text and when possible images as well. And Steve, you've been at Q for about almost three years now um, and expanded the industry's footprint footprint with this technology that we'll, we'll cover more in a bit to over a thousand stations. And this is the number um, that, that I thought was really interesting, over 6 billion visual cues annually. And we'll find out in a moment what um, visual cues are. Um, but Steve, just quickly, you've got such a deep background, but I mean, you spent um, time in the industry, you're a radio owner, uh, spent time um, on the NEB board and, and different industry boards as um, a participant, a chair. Um, you've been recognized multiple times by Radio Inc. magazine as one of the 40 most powerful pe people in radio. You are a radio guy. <laughs> so now you're a technology guy, though. Um, so let me, let me start first by saying we're talking about visual ads and in-dash displays. So much is happening with the car. I mean, um, video, I mean, you can watch Netflix in your car. Um, you can get streaming, you can get podcasts. Radio is still a predominant um, way people use audio in the car, which is good. And radio um, has been, I'm not sure if it's one arm time behind their back, but the audio experience has been so critical through the history of radio. But there is an ability to do visual things. So just let me just kind of frame this to ask you to speak a little bit to your vision for how local radio broadcasters can make use of that in-dash visual asset and monetize it. Um, as well as for programming and promotion, um, there's money in them our hills, maybe. Thank you for the kind words, Rick. I really appreciate it. Uh, we have worked together for a lot of years on a lot of different <laughs> projects, and I'm a radio guy. You if are. Foremost, I'm involved <laughs> in technology, but I'm a radio guy. When it comes to Q and with what we're doing, I think fundamentally, you have to start with the consumer's experience, the listener experience, the customer experience, because that's what's going to drive the long term success of radio or any product for that matter. And if you look at what our traditional audience is now available to see, they're getting Spotify, Pandora, YouTube, XM Sirius, Apple CarPlay over and above all of the streaming services that will be coming down the pike that are going to be moving into the automobile as well. So radio can no longer, in my opinion, afford to just be a one dimensional service. There has been the ability to put visuals on the dashboard of vehicles for 20 years or so, even longer with RDS. You've had RDS and HD. But what we have done at Q is try to make it a very manageable, easy process to do that links and enhances the listening experience and we want radio to have, to have a visual element. Are we going to be television? No, that's not what we're talking about doing. But if we can reinforce what the listener is hearing with a static photo or with a script or with words that reinforce, it adds to the experience. It makes it much more engaging. And we're finding that our listeners, our, those customers really like the product we're providing. So that's what I think the opportunity is for radio. We can talk about how to monetize and answer those questions as we get into this. Sure. But ultimately, it is about improving the listener and or viewer experience for what the radio product is, not just in the automobile, but ultimately on a stream, on an app, anywhere the radio platform is being distributed making sure that that product has a visual component to it. To me, I mean, that's so solid. If you focus on the experience and get that right, good things flow from that. Um, if you kind of um, shortchange yourself on, on what the opportunity is and what the problem is you're solving, 
you don't get to a complete um, positive outcome, I think. So I really like the way you framed that, um, Steve. So, um, you know, some people know more or less about Q. Um, you're doing in dash, you know, visuals, uh, text and images. Um, but what what exactly does Q do? Do you sell these ads or is it, are you just a technology? And I shouldn't say just, are you a technology platform or what is Q? I, des I describe this as a content management platform. So for years, you've had the pipeline. You've had the ability to send text from the radio station to the transmitter site and ultimately out of the air through RDS or HD. But it's very difficult or complicated to manage, change, uh, display, construct, take off, put on content. And Q, what we focus on is making it very easily through a cloud-based app that can be ex accessed anywhere. So the program director can do it from home. Sales manager has the ability to look online from wherever they may be located. You don't have to be tied to the station. But we're about managing that visual content for the display and syncing it up with the audio so that the listener does have that great experience that we were talking about just a moment ago. If it's their favorite song, we want them to see song title and artist and potentially the album art. If it's a commercial for a client, we want them to be able to see the name of the business and reinforce the message. If it's their favorite personality, we want them to be able to see who their in-studio guest is, what contest might be being played on the air right now, what the secret word is, what the studio phone number is, whatever makes the experience better for the listener to know how to connect and be engaged with the radio station. Yeah, I mean, that that's clearly has an opportunity to enrich the experience. And, it's, and, and you had mentioned the word sync a couple of times. Is that um, kind of a recommended practice that these visuals and text and images are synced with the audio, or is that not necessarily always the case? No, it, it has two forms. Historically, it has been displayed without being synced, and Q kind of made our made our bones, so to speak, in the industry by providing the ability to sync up commercials. Gotcha. With the display or sync up songs with the display and provide song title and artist and enhanced information. But you can do it both synchronized and non synchronized. Um, depending on what the use is, we have the ability to manage content to display in either format. So I mentioned um, 6 billion um, visual cues and, uh, you know, maybe a thousand radio stations. We talked about this a little bit earlier too, Stephen. How many people are actually on the street selling this stuff? So, um, so your cue. But who's using Q? Who, who are the radio groups and just some of the metrics? How many, you know, how many stations, how many, how many ads are going out and uh, maybe the receive side too. I mean, who's able to receive these in cars or the, you know, the image only or the uh, text only, the image as well. Just a sense of the structure and operating in the marketplace. So let's talk about who our customer base is and what they're doing with it. So we serve right now about 1400 radio stations. And those stations are from the small stations to the largest groups, you know, among the larger groups, Cox, Bo uh, Cox Beasley, Odyssey. You know, we serve some of the Cumulus stations. We, we've we got great relationships. I don't want to get into naming names because they're all important to us. <laughs> right, exactly. Who is your favorite child? <laughs> you know, they, they're all favorites. That's exactly. There you go. Uh, at different levels, different companies have different levels of utilizing what our product is. Yeah. Some people will use it just for the basic functionality of song title, artist information, and station identification. Others okay. will use our more advanced services that do get into the advertising services that have the ability to really monetize that. Um, so, you know, that's what our stations do. What a visual cue is, is a display on the screen. Yeah. So there are programming cues and there are advertising cues and there are public service cues and there are emergency information cues that all kind of follow in under this big umbrella. So a station has the ability with our product to reinforce their programming by some of the examples I gave earlier, the name of the morning show, the phone numbers, information about the song title and artist. From a sales standpoint, they can sell the associated messaging with, uh, with a commercial or advertising campaign. And then I think the public service function and the public safety yeah. function is something that's really important about this too, because you have the ability if you're you know, I remember when the tornadoes came through Kentucky, which is my home state, seeing messages on the screens that said, need help, have info, we're here in the studio phone number. Mm. Or the American Red Cross, want to help, donate to the Red Cross and the, the Red Cross phone number and website. 
or tornado warning in effect until 6 p.m or snow warning, snow advisory. You can put all kinds of information up on the screen, but it's reinforcing at the basic level, Rick, it is reinforcing what the listeners hear and depend on from their local radio station and adding a visual reinforcement to that, whether it's programming, whether it's sales, or whether it's news and public service. Um, that makes total sense. Now maybe switch to the advertiser's perspective. Um, so, you know, advertisers love radio. Um, they're used to thinking of radio as audio. Now, all of a sudden, they have this visual real estate. And um, like we're saying visual cues, and, and, and Stevie and I were talking, we're not quite sure what to call this inventory, maybe, um, for, for the industry is, you know, it's display ad inventory, maybe. Um, so from the advertiser, they're used to buying audio. Now, somebody from these radio stations working with Q, maybe others, um, have, well, you can do text and image in the car as well, and it can be synced to the audio. And I guess a couple things that I'd love to get your insights on. When you sync audio to a visual, what happens, you know, from an advertiser's perspective in terms of how effective that message is? And then how how is it bought and sold? Is it digital sellers at radio stations because this is digital like inventory? Is it the broadcast sellers or are these integrated teams? Well, let me begin by demystifying it a little bit because yeah. I think lots of times when I start talking to a station, they envision how do you schedule it? How do you traffic it? How do you make this happen? Is it a digital ticket? Yeah. and an over the year product? So what we do is follow the cart number. And yep. we enable the radio station to say to McDonald's, let's start with the sales process. And it's okay. the local McDonald's. Thank you. You're doing a schedule with us. You're advertising with us. You know the power of what our audio is. You know the power of our audience for an upcharge. And it generally can be a flat fee or 10% is what we see probably most common. Yep. McDonald's has the ability to add a visual context or visual message that will display on the screen while their commercial is playing. So it could be a 60 second McDonald's commercial that's playing. It's cart number 8380. The station puts it in one time as cart number 8380. And when that McDonald's spot plays, cart number 8380, we will display on the screen. So it will say McDonald's, $1.99 Big Mac. Gotcha. Or ah. a sausage biscuit, get one free. Or McDonald's open 24 hours. Whatever the different, it reinforces what the audio message is that's being heard on the radio commercial at the same time. And I think that's something that is real important to understand. The way that this brings the most value to our advertisers, they're running the radio ad, and if the client is or the listener is seeing the message displayed like a billboard in the vehicle. Think of it the same way you would use outdoor. So you're driving down the road, you want it to be able to be seen very quickly, absorbed very quickly. You don't want to be distracting drivers with a lot of, <laughs> but you're driving down the road and you hear the commercial for McDonald's and you glance at your screen and you see McDonald's, $1.99 Big Mac. Then it reinforces what that message is. And we are seeing that, you know, clients seem to be, I have not gotten out and done any research that says, you know, you get a lift of X of sales or things of that nature. Right now, it's all anecdotal. But there was research done that said that in, when you add a visual to a radio ad, you get a 63% lift in retention. Nice. So that is a big, big lift. And I'm seeing nothing that is contrary to that. Clients that are using this product are really using this product aggressively and seem to be very pleased with. And I can tell you, as we get into this, I'll give you some anecdotal examples of how it helps and what it brings to radio. Okay. Um, it's about reinforcing the message that's on the radio ad with a quick, if you were driving by a billboard, what billboard message would you put up to reinforce the radio campaign, except the billboards right in the car on the dashboard of the vehicle as you're driving down the highway? In this, um, I'm just curious who is able to see these visual radio ads. Uh, and this, I'm um, just asking around, I get I get kind of different answers. Uh, so for the text, um, like the RDS um, technology, that probably has a much big, bigger penetration among cars on the road. Uh, HD radio, particularly with newer model cars, ha has some penetration. But what what is the penetration? I mean, who is the audience uh, possible for these ads? So. <clears throat> Xperi says that 80% of the vehicles on the road yep. can see text in one form or another. Okay. 
So that, and by the way, that's vehicles, that's not passenger cars. So that includes construction fleets, that includes U-Hauls, that includes buses, dump trucks. You put it, if it's on the road, it's included. So it's obviously you would expect it to be higher than 80% of passenger vehicles. Right, right. We do tell our clients, sell this as a text campaign because the ah. really is in reinforcing the message with the text support. Okay. Now, the ability to add with the great Xperia technology and the HD technology of putting that reinforcement with the logo or a picture of the Big Mac or whatever you might want it to be, that's great. But about 20% of the vehicles on the road can actually receive those. So sell it as a text campaign and say to the clients and for the 20% of the vehicles that can receive the logo, we're going to provide that to you at no additional charge. It right. really is a text value benefit right now, whether it's text on HD or whether it's text on RDS. And then if they have the enhanced HD service, that makes it that much better. That's right. The technology that I use for that is you're driving down the road and you hear a song you haven't heard for years. What you want to know is the name of the artist and the song title. That's right. Now, if you've got the album art, that makes the experience that much richer. But what you're really wanting to know is the name of the artist and the song title. It's the same thing on the commercial experience. Who's the client? What's the message that's being reinforced? And the logo or the graphic or the visual that comes with the advanced HD, that's icing on top of the cake, but the real power is the text. Yeah, no question. And and people engage with this. I mean, you mentioned kind of testimonials. There are some re are some research studies I've seen that show some engagement and some lift, um, combining the audio plus the visual elements. Um, so that, that's really encouraging. Uh, and you know, people, I guess, behaviorally uh, are more used for better. You mentioned, uh, you know, traffic and safety and so on, uh, distracted drivers. But people are, you know, frankly, used to looking and reading off of um, dashboards, uh, screens, you know, their GPS, uh, you know, Apple Maps, Google Maps, Waze, whatever they're using. Um, they're, they are interacting with their media and entertainment uh, information systems. They're getting a lot of display information off there, so the you know, you're kind of task loading um, drivers anyway. Uh, so the so you know for better or worse, that's that's the cockpit of the car. Yeah, and then tell people because yeah. you know, inevitably I'll get a question. Well, what about driver safety? And I'll say, listen, we're NHTSA compliant. First of all, that's right. Yeah, yeah. Traffic Safety Administration, but we're just getting radio up to the same platform. That exactly. That exactly. We're not breaking new territory. We're just getting radio into the game like other clients uh, like other uh, exactly i mean it's it's from a listener perspective especially younger listeners who are so digital centric um you know they look at the screen and there's nothing there uh, so it's like what something's missing with my radio station it's, so in a sense you're completing the experience and giving them some clue because they're so used to that anyway um it's kind of interesting i think um so yes you mentioned some some case studies and like the mcdonald examples and some of the studies I've seen show, show different kinds of lift. It depends upon the business category, the creative, and the target audience and everything. But, you know, the numbers are pretty impressive. And it does make sense when you do multi, you know, sense kind of involvement with things. It, it is more engaging. And I don't know for evolving as a species, but um, people are able to drive and manage a lot of information in that cockpit. But any, any case studies or examples that kind of stick out in your mind as good ones? Again, uh, I'll give you some anecdotal stories. I don't have the case studies sitting in front of me, but here's here's one of my favorites, and it was at my radio stations in Kentucky, and this was early on. So we had a car wash that opened, and uh, the car wash wanted to test radio, wanted to see if radio was going to work, and so they gave a code to each of the three radio groups in the Nice. Room. So text clean to one, text wow to another, text wash to another. And each of the three groups had a different code that they were putting into their copy because they're wanting to see what's happening, want to see what lift they got. Our stations performed much better than the competition did. Not because we necessarily have more listeners than the competition did, but we're putting on the dashboard text wow to 68700. And so for a free car wash. For a free car wash, text WOW to 68700. We were able to immediately connect, reinforce, brand, and put that information there so that the listener got the text campaign back in the free car wash. There was no write it down, let me remember that, let me do this. It was just an immediate thing. 
I, I had a pizza place that uh, had been trying, it was a, not one of the major pizza chains, and they were trying to establish their delivery business. And so the whole point of the ad campaign that they did was the phone number of the pizza delivery business. And it was amazing to see the increased lift in retention. We could do some surveys. We did some research with with Jacobs and others. And the number of people that would hear and see the commercial one time and be able to recall the phone number. But it was on the screen with the display. So what the real power of this, Rick, is it does raise it, but it it supercharges the effectiveness of radio advertising. Right. That's what I'm trying to explain to people when we're doing this. I don't see this as a separate advertising category. Interesting. Separate category. Yeah. But this is about reinforcing the message that the synchronized ads in particular, it is making radio advertising more effective. And you are able to draw a higher rate because the clients get that. You know, it, it has just been, it's been pretty cool to watch it happen. <laughs> right. And our non-synchronized, if I could take for just a moment to talk about Please. our yeah, yeah. One of the big challenges that the radio industry was facing is that, and we're seeing this from a lot of the legal law firms, we're seeing it some with auto, uh, where they want to come in and they want to buy the display time. So you'll have an agency that may say, we want to buy your dashboard displays. That's great. Um, like every other radio broadcaster, I'm glad to have that services revenue, that legal business revenue coming into my station. But I don't want to sell them the complete display on my dashboard. So if I'm running that McDonald's or that Lowe's or that Kohl's commercial, I don't necessarily want there to be a law firm message on the screen at the same time because Mm -hmm. the listener sees that the Jacobs research showed that the listeners, when that happens, listeners think the radio station's not paying attention. The radio station forgot to update the message. Oh, interesting. Yes. It is a lack of attention from the radio station, not an intentional advertising device. Yep. So we learned a lot from that and working with some of the major broadcasters, we developed a new product that takes that super display or that super client, the law firm or others, out of the commercial break and puts them into the middle of the content. So song comes on, the listener experience, which has to be first, there's 90 seconds of song title, artist information, album art if the car's equipped. And then there's a 30 second message that comes up and displays what the client's message is while the music continues to play. And then it goes back to the song title artist information. And we've structured that in a way so it's not intrusive on the listener. And we're getting a lot of program directors that are really being very positive about what we've developed. A lot of major highly recognized program directors because they got the bad experience. Right. Don't want to lose their branding opportunities, but they realize the need to find a way to meet this appetite that the advertising community has. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's kind of, again, it goes back, I think, to the way we're training audiences, if you will. I mean, that's uh, almost a video equivalent of an audio mid roll spot. Um, you know, you, you're, you're listening to your content. Uh, there's a spot, and you go back to your content. Although, in this case, you don't interrupt the content, you still get to enjoy the audio. And and here's what was here's what was kind of interesting about the old way and why I think that this is such an opportunity slash challenge for the radio industry. Uh, I was talking to a colleague who flew. In, well, I don't think she would. I'm not going to say who it is. If someone wants to talk to me, I'll be glad to share. You can tell us. It's just the two of us. That's right. Uh, <laughs> but she went to visit. She's in the media business, and she went to see her sister down in South Florida. Her sister's not a consumer of media within like we are. She just listens to radio stations and watch TV stations. She doesn't try to analyze or or think. And she got in her car, and this person said, what radio station are you listening to? She said, I'm listening to the one the law firm built. And okay. she said, excuse me, she said the law firm owns a radio station now. And that was sounds- not calling it by the station's name, was now right. referring to it by the law firm because that message was so prevalent. Yep. I shared this story with Pierre Bouvard, who I have such high regard for, and Pierre said that's incredibly exciting and incredibly frightening all at the Absolutely. same time. Absolutely. Absolutely. It's exciting because it does show what the value of this real estate is. That's right. It is frightening because if you don't do it the right way, stations can lose their brand, can lose their identity, can alienate other advertisers. And so a big part of what Q's responsibility, I think, to the industry is better technologies, better practices, better experiences, keeping the listener forward so that we are helping 
radio companies across the nation generate more revenue. We're helping their advertisers get better results. We're helping the listeners have a better experience. And we're maintaining the programming integrity of the brands. And we're trying to make sure that it's a good experience for all four entities, not that it gets out of whack or disproportionate or begins to alienate the listeners to the radio station. Yeah, that's really fabulous. And I know, I mean, that's a um, really tight playbook and it, you know, makes sense and you're, you're validating it uh, going forward in the industry. So that, that's kind of exciting. And it seems like, you know, the narrative arc, if you will, is that this is a technology, especially on the tech side, it's been around for a while, even on the digital side. But it seems like it's getting more um, gravitas and momentum in the market now. I mean, largely through efforts like yours and others to say, let's see if we can get some incremental revenue uh, out of this platform we have. And well, I know when you're at NAB, you know, oh, go ahead. Just, yeah, if I could, because I yeah, want please. to talk about what those revenue expectations are. Okay. Yep. You're seeing advertisers pay three, five, seven, eight thousand dollars a month to be one of the content partnerships. Yep. As opposed to paying $2,500 a month to own the dashboard of the radio station, because radio stations are now more informed. They know what this real estate is worth. They're doing a better job of pricing it. But I'm seeing stations, you know, I, I know one cluster in a top 10 market that is doing $900,000 of revenue across their stations strictly because of the content partnerships. Wow. And and when you see that happening. That's annually, the 900000 Yeah. I, excuse me, it's at 900. The number, it's it's fifty thousand dollars a month across five radio stations, so uh, twenty five thousand and six hundred thousand dollars a year is supposed to nine. Okay. I want to be accurate as I'm I'm describing this, but yeah, yeah. still, okay, six hundred thousand as opposed to as opposed to what they might have been getting was fifty thousand dollars some total from that technology in the past. People are making money, and then you do the incremental ad onto the ad sinks that we were talking about. It's really beginning to generate some revenue for stations and a much better experience for the listeners. Yep, excellent. Um, and I know a um, couple last things. I want to kind of open it up um, with the final question, saying anything else we need to know about. But um, where are we in this kind of journey to tightening this all up? I know when you were at NAB and, and since. Um, there was a few reports that NAB Technology Department issued on dashboard best practices. I mean, what, what are broadcasters doing with metadata? I mean, whether or not they have the tools, how are they using the metadata? Is it consistent um, usage in the industry? Uh, and NAB had a few reports that have come out and you've spoken to some of the things that you're doing to help make this more seamless, um, immersive, engaging experience. Uh, how are we with sort of the technology platforms and and what the consumers are experiencing in the cars and what the cars are doing, at least with the OEM receivers and so on? Do we, do we have a good kind of environment where there still need to be some work done there? No, I, th I think there's always work that needs to be done. And let me say that NAB and the team there, Sam Matheny and his technology team, they are constantly aware of this, but yeah, you know, Rick, you're an NAB alumnus. I'm an NAB alumnus. You, it's a trade association, and it's not about mandating things to the members. It's about servicing the members. Yep. And so I think the answer to this is better suited being in the private enterprise where we're offering a solution and then letting the broadcaster determine if this is the best path for them to take. Right. As opposed yep. to NAB mandating. But that right. said, there were times that I really wished NAB could do something like a <laughs> mandate. It was a mess. And I do think it's getting better. But yeah. what I also say is we're just now in the first inning of what's going to be the ball game because this this technology doesn't just need to be seen as song title artist on the dashboard of the car. This needs to be seen as a comprehensive way to provide accompanying visual messaging on whatever platform the listener chooses to utilize his or her local radio station. So if it's a stream, if it's an app, if it's technology that you and I can't imagine right now, if it's using the Xperia Auto Dash, the DTS Auto stage yeah. that's going to be such an asset for us, whatever those platforms are, radio has to make sure that we're taking the steps. But let's take the first step. Let's don't be paralyzed. We're trying to make it as easy as possible for stations to take the first step and show them how they can monetize this as a real income source for their stations. Nice. Yeah, I think just my experience is radio um, broadcasters are, you know, growing on the digital side, bringing in more digital people. 
So some of the things you're talking about, the kind of aptitude, sensibilities, um, you know, maybe even appetite to, to kind of do this, I think has been coming more into the industry um, in recent years and maybe earlier, earlier years when this technology was, was first becoming available. Well, let me let me flip this around. You're the guy hosting the podcast and I'm the guest. What? You can't ask me questions. OK, so <laughs> I'm going to. So here's the question from your perspective, watching all of this. Where yeah. do you think we are on the continuum? Do you think that we've kind of reached a tipping point where people are beginning to really do something with this? What what do you think the opportunity for the industry is right now? Yes, yeah, so my sense is that um, the technology has been around a while. There's been some inconsistent implementation or not implementation in the early years of RDS and then HD. Uh, it was interesting through your efforts and NAB's efforts, uh, Sam and team there, to try to say, let's take this platform seriously and make it you know, coherent and, and have a more standardized experience. All those are good building blocks. And then in, in different areas of technology and innovation, you know, my professional experience has been oftentimes you have a basic idea that is actually really good, but there's no place to plant it. It needs a platform, you know, a consistent platform, a tool set, a bench set, you know, that enables workflow and so on. Uh, it interacts with all the pieces, maybe bridges some things that are sort of missing or inconsistent, um, as we've been discussing. So I think you know, now is a really exciting time to look at this technology because more is in place uh, from the technology side, from the workflow side, from broadcasters in terms of selling this and communicating the value to advertisers. And as you were saying earlier, even just from the audience experience, they're, they're used to and want to get information looking at um, dashboard displays. I mean, that main radio is just something to listen to. Now I'm always looking at that screen for something. And if radio starts to give me something back, cool, didn't used to get that. So it seems like it is a good opportunity to have radio get this new value proposition um, and, and leverage it to greater effect in the market for the audience experience. Coming back to that, totally agree with that. And then it gives the advertiser another way to make that connection with um, with listeners. And so they're able to get all the positives of radio and like that audio mid roll, if you will, without interrupting the primary experience of audio. So it's I'm kind of excited to see where broadcasters take it next. When I speak to people in the field, broadcasters, technology companies, agencies, some brands, it's kind of they speak to opportunity and some of them start to tell the stories like you're telling. Uh, but it's like um, I'm wondering, you know, when more of the opportunity gets converted into, yes, this, this is starting to work. So that's one of the reasons why I want to do this podcast with you. I see some momentum and you know, some things being accomplished. So I just kind of wanted to check in and see what you're seeing. I think we're at the tipping point. And yeah. all the things that you just said, my objective is the cue to a degree is the Sherpa for the industry to say, how do we climb that mountain? How yeah. do we get across that forward? How do we make sure that we have a great revenue opportunity and we don't damage the relationship we have with yeah. the other guys? Yeah, it's a good, good balancing act. Is there, so what else do we need to know? Do we miss anything in our conversation or we did a good job? You did a great job. You were <laughs> all, the, all the questions. I, I think what I would just say to people is that there is a real opportunity. There is a there, there. Uh, in Glasgow and Bowling Green, Kentucky, our station's probably going to do $100,000 worth of revenue with it in, actually we did $100,000 worth of revenue with it in 22 and we're looking to grow on that. So there is such an opportunity for stations of all sizes. Yep. And it's not as complicated as it used to be. That yep. means that, you know, and by the way, I should point out, we ride on a signal. This right. is part of the broadcast signal. So when you get on the fringe of your signal, the technology gets more fringy. When you're at the core of the signal, the, to the technology is more, uh, more robust. But right. listeners understand that. Advertisers yep. understand that. And that's just yep. part of the physics of being in the radio business. Absolutely. Steve, thank you so much for joining us today in our Leading Local Insights podcast. Great pleasure to reunite with you under any circumstances. And to everybody listening, thank you for joining us. We look forward to having you join us again soon. Check us out at www.bia.com uh, for our events, podcasts, webinars, complimentary reports, and to learn more about what we do, we'd love to engage with you. One thing I'll call out is we do have a daily newsletter uh, about the industry. It's curated content. And we also talk about some of the things we're putting out there, um, free newsletter, get great feedback and that people seem to appreciate it. Um, so hopefully you're a subscriber, Steve. 
Absolutely. Absolutely. That's good to hear. All right. Thanks, everybody. Uh, have a great day, and we'll catch you next time on our next podcast. Thank you, Rick. Thank you.